in the personage of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. I'm grateful to Almighty God Allah for the man who is in our midst today, who is a divine leader, teacher, and guide to the whole of humanity. The man that I speak of is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I greet all of you, my dear beloved brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum. Let me be uh, among those who have already uh, wished those in the audience and that uh, uh, a happy, happy uh, Father's Day. And for those uh, brothers that will one day, Allah willing, become a father. I am uh, very, very happy today to uh, introduce our keynote speaker who I believe will be making actually her first uh, keynote address on a Sunday program here at Mas Mariam. Uh, she will be with us momentarily and as we await her arrival I would like to just say something on father. I am uh, a son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and although I am very blessed to come from his loins, such a great man that many of us did not understand, but are coming into a greater understanding of what that man did for us and what he is continuing to do for us as a people. I did not meet my father until I was seven years of age. And uh, in between uh, that time and his departure, when I was 10 years old, I had very little interaction with him. But thanks to Almighty God, Allah, and to him, he prepared one, not only for me personally, but for all of us who would sit in his seat as a father over the house. And I'm so grateful to Almighty God, Allah, for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who has been an example of excellence and has helped me to develop into the man that I am today and hopefully to be a better man tomorrow. As I was making uh, my way here this morning with my son, uh, the thought had come to my mind, as I always do in reviewing the scriptures. If you notice, there's not much mention of the prophet's fathers, with the exception of the relationship between David and Solomon and Joseph and his father. But of the major prophets, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, even to Muhammad, there's hardly mention of the father. Muhammad the prophet was raised by his uncle. There is no mention of Abraham's father. Of course, Moses was raised in Egypt. And I said, you know, son, this is interesting that the father is not mentioned or given much importance in the prophet's lives. What could this mean? And this is what I concluded, that men of consequence, men of destiny, like a people of consequence and a people of destiny, don't necessarily need the relationship of a biological father more than a relationship with the heavenly father. And when you are missing the physical father in your life, it moves you closer to a relationship with God. So the prophets had no other choice but to get closer to God because it is from God's will that each of us have come to birth in the circle of life. Our parents, mother and father, are just agents of the Heavenly Father or the One God. So we must, those of us 
who are missing that special relationship with your biological or physical father, know that God is ever present and you and I need to establish a better relationship with God. I think it's Paul that said that there is but one God, one Father, who is above all, but in us all, through us all. So to have a father is indeed special. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, as you know, never met his father, never knew his father, has had no contact with his father. And you see the great man that God has made of him and his relationship with God is such, I, I don't have anyone or anything that I can compare it to. But he fell in love with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who fathered him into this mission and his relationship with Almighty God Allah has made him the great leader, teacher, and guide that he is in the world today. Let us thank Almighty God Allah for the Honorable <laughs> Minister Louis Farrakhan, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who is fathering a nation. And so to all of those in the audience and those of us who are men who have become fathers, we thank Allah for the woman through whom we have been able and blessed to reproduce life. Mom could not be mom without dad. Dad can't be dad without mom. So this is a special uh, day that, like Mother's Day, we should always be found honoring our parents. We don't wait until one day out of the year to buy a card that expresses our thanks and wait for one day out of the year to give something to our fathers. This should be something that we do more than one day out of the year. The honor of mother and father is what ensures us of the blessings and the favor of God. This was one of the chief commandments that God gave to Moses. Honor thy what? And thy, that thy long in the land, see, that the Lord your God has given to you. This does not, uh, in my interpretation of that commandment, simply mean longevity of life, long life, but long in whatever you set out to accomplish. The yardstick or the measure of that success will be determined on the respect and the love and the honor that you show to your parents. If you lack the right kind of honor and love and respect for your parents, then there may be the diminishing of God's blessings in your life. So let whatever we have accomplished and whatever we are seeking to accomplish, let there always be words of gratitude and deep appreciation come from our lips for God and our parents. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave to his servant, Minister Farrakhan, this valuable lesson. He said, brother, you're going to reach the pinnacle of success in this world's life. He said, but I hope you won't forget who brought you there. That's, that's deep. Because no matter how high you go and to the heights that God blesses you to climb in life, you can come tumbling down if you forget those that help you to get to where God would have you to be. So gratitude 
is a sign of belief. And whenever we fall into ingratitude, it shows that we uh, have fallen into disbelief. So the mark of a believer is gratitude. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For you can tell the righteous, for they walk the earth in humbleness. So we're still uh, awaiting our, <laughs> our keynote speaker. So now I have to extend uh, my remarks. But um, uh, on that note of gratitude and humility, that's one of the great lessons that Minister Farrakhan has taught me personally and has taught all of us because he is the most humble man, humble human being that I have ever met in my life. And I mean, his humility really is indescribable. It doesn't matter what situation the minister may find himself in, he always yields himself and waits on God to improve the condition. He's very patient, he's very humble, he's very respective. In those travels that I've been blessed to be with him, and our chief of staff is present, our chief of protocol, they have been on numerous, numerous international trips with him. Sometimes the accommodations may not be uh, suitable or what we would want for our minister, but the minister doesn't matter. If they have a, a little place for him that's no bigger than a cell, he will sit there, he will accept that condition, and not once complaining about, wow, why, why have, haven't they made better accommodations for me? In other words, he does not see himself bigger than what God has made him, even though he's a big man and a great leader and teacher in the world. Yet, as the scripture says, he makes himself of no reputation. This is a beautiful, beautiful man with wonderful qualities that all of us should be learning. There's a wonderful story, and I don't want to put our dear brother on the spot, but he can help me if he feels the spirit. And that's my big brother and our chief of staff, Brother Leonard Farrakhan, who was recently on a trip to Africa uh, where uh, there was some, uh, I would say, uh, circumstances that were a little inconvenient. But if he doesn't mind coming and just sharing with you this, because I think that it is a wonderful example and a story to tell. Our chief of staff, Brother Leonard Farrakhan. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. First of all, happy Father's Day to all our brothers, men, in the audience. Happy Father's Day. If you all believe, well, it, he does want me to actually say a few words, but he really was asking for help because I think maybe he hadn't prepared to go much longer than where he was going. But let's give Minister Ishmael a great round of applause. And special greetings to all the laborers here at Mas Maryam. Um, I'm privileged to serve with you. Sister Claudette, it's great to see you as always. Um, we really try very hard to assist, assist Minister Farrakhan in his work and his labor and in his mission. But Minister Ishmael briefly, and, and I think maybe the speaker is here now, but the, briefly he was talking about a recent trip that we made to Timbuktu. Timbuktu. That's in, in African, Mali. Timbuktu is a desolate place now, once a great, glorious kingdom. Now it's all but 
destroyed due to, of course, colonialism and, 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 and the oppression and, and discrimination and hatred that our people have experienced in Africa, Timbuktu is gone. Except there's a seed still there. The people are still there, the culture is still there, but they have almost nothing. So the quarters, we were blessed to be able to go there at the invitation of Brother Muammar Gaddafi and the, the living standards was so, so undesirable. And as a matter of fact, this is my first opportunity to thank um, uh, all of those that were on the trip because we suffered in that environment because it wasn't something that we were accustomed to. But the minister was the one. He said, brother, just set your mind. And he sat quietly. And they had airplanes that were supposed to fly us out of that place. And we got up at like 7 in the morning. 8 o'clock at night, we were still sitting there. My brother Mustafa, uh, Brother Joshua, and all of us were there, Minister Ishmael. We were more um, upset about it than him. He, you couldn't even tell he was upset. Even the other heads of state that were there, the, guy, the, the president of Mali, who was coming to see, in, to see people off at the airport, he came like at 9, 10, 11, then again at 1, then again at 3 o'clock, another time at 5 or 6 in the evening, and he asked Minister Farrakhan, brother, you still here? Would you like me to get one of my planes to fly you out? He says, oh, no, brother, I'm here uh, at their invitation, and they, they are my host, and, and I'm going to wait for whatever accommodations they provide. Let's give our leader a great round of applause because, you see, so the lesson of humility um, is something we all can learn from. Most of us in the nation, even though we are less in terms of our assignment from Allah on the planet than Minister Farrakhan, sometimes our, our patients are, are, not, uh, are shorter than his. And I think mine probably is shorter than his, but I'm trying to learn from his example. But I don't try to be very honest with you, brother, to out-minister Minister Farrakhan. He's here to do his job. I'm here to be impatient about the way he's treated. <laughs> Give me a round of applause for that. <laughs> May Allah greet you, bless you as I greet you in peace. Happy Father's Day. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Let's give another warm round of applause for our Chief of Staff, Brother Leonard Farrakhan Muhammad. And now we've reached that point in our program uh, last week. If you all missed our keynote speaker from Moss number 74, Indianapolis, Indiana, Minister Nuri Muhammad, you missed a treat. I mean, I had to call him the arsonist because he comes and lights fires but he came fully insured for all of the damage that he caused. And this Sunday, I could not have thought of a better person. In fact, about it, I believe this would be the first uh, female speaker on the occasion of Father's Day. And like uh, Mother's Day, as the minister has always reminded me when I have wanted a female speaker on Mother's Day, he said, no, son, it's always best that that message comes from a male. So I said, okay, well, if it is good for a male to speak on Mother's Day, then it should be good for a daughter to speak on the occasion of Father's Day. This wonderful, wonderful person who's a big sister and has been an inspiration in my life, has always looked after me and her brothers and sisters, and she seems to have been born, not seems, but has been born with the spirit of Allah and certainly carries that powerful gene from her father. So you're in for a treat this morning because this is, if we had the arsonist last Sunday, then uh, you got a little more than arsonist today. When she steps to the podium, it's just going to be fire. She won't be lighting it. She'll just be blowing out fire. 
So we checked to make sure she came with an insurance policy because we're still recovering from last week. But uh, we are very, very happy and honored today that our dear sister and minister has accepted the invitation to deliver the Father's Day address. She's the daughter of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and is one of his great, great helpers in this cause. Mas Meriam, without further ado, please help me to welcome to the rostrum Minister Donna Farrakhan Mohammed. Please receive her with all of your love. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. In their holy and righteous names, I would like to greet my brothers and my sisters with the nation's greetings of peace and paradise of Assalamu alaikum. It is indeed an honor and a privilege bestowed upon me today to be able to speak on Father's Day. I first would like to thank my physical father, but he's also my spiritual father, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, for giving of himself to raise up the dead. I too was one of the dead that needed to be resurrected. I thank Allah that Allah would bring me back on the right path after I strayed away wandering in the wilderness, wandering in this kingdom of the white man. I thank Allah that my father had enough love in his heart, had enough wisdom and knowledge in his brain that he could offer his daughter wisdom that would stop me in my tracks and turn me back into the favor of Allah. I thank Allah for such a father. I thank Allah for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, for loving the Honorable Elijah Muhammad enough, who is his spiritual father, that he would submit himself to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad so that he could be taught the life-given teachings. I thank Allah for putting a heart in that man that was kind enough and soft enough that he would be able to submit to another man with superior wisdom. And in so doing, he saved his life. But he also is a blessing to the black man and woman of America who is still wandering in the wilderness without sight, without vision. And the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan 
has been put in our midst today, that he can be a guide for the lost brother and sister in the wilderness of North America. The Quran says that God never chooses Or I should put it this way, the Quran says that Allah always chooses a prophet and a messenger from among the people. Then the Quran says, if you were an angel, I would have sent you one. Which means that he resurrects one from among you who has experienced the same pain and suffering and trials that you have experienced. So he can speak to you because he is of the same experiences that you have come from. I thank Allah for raising up among, among us today, a man, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. He is a spiritual father to the lost found members of the nation. I know you were asking, what does that mean, lost, found, lost, lost? When you were lost, that means you've lost your direction. When you were lost, that means you got turned around, mixed up. When you are lost, you need someone to guide you back on the right path. Well, Allah sent us a man to do just that. to guide us back to the right path. Many of you are so far removed of the history of the black man and woman in this country. You don't understand why we are in this condition today still after we've had so many black leaders. We still appear to be blind, deaf, and dumb. I want to go over or go back down memory lane. because we can't go forward, not unless we understand what happened. We can't appreciate how far we have come unless we understand what condition we were in although not fully repaired, we're on the road of repair. Many of you may have heard of the name Willie Lynch. But Willie Lynch was a slave owner and a slave master 
who taught other slave masters how to make a Negro, or back then, a nigger. Why was that so important? Because they took you as kings and queens from your land where you used to build pyramids, had the highest form of mathematics, the highest form of intelligence, but your fathers were kidnapped from their land by the white man and brought to the shores of America. This is not racism. This is actual fact. The white man is a scientist. And he knows something about nature. So he studied the black man. And if he didn't study you for a good purpose, he was studying you for an evil purpose. And that purpose was to bring you down from that high position as father. And to make you a slave. In his kingdom, this is the white man's world that we are living in. It is his kingdom. His kingdom, or his vision, that he had for the black man was not to be ruler was not to be king. His vision for you, black man, was to be slave, was to be boy. Because no matter how old you were, he always referred to you, black man, as a boy. That was his vision. Of what your position and his kingdom was going to be. You could never be the father or the God that God created you, not in the white man's kingdom. But he had to work on you, black man. How did he get to you? How was he able to keep you in this condition? It is called the breaking of the black woman. I want to read you something, sisters, to let you know how key you are to this black man's kingdom coming into fruition. Willie Lynch wrote this and I'm going to read it to you. It says, then take the female, run a series of tests on her to see if she will submit to your desires willingly. Test her in every way because she is the most important factor for good economics. It's about money with him. If she shows any sign of resistance and submitting completely to your will, do not hesitate to use the bullwhip on her to exact that last bit of B, which is a female dog, out of her. Take care not to kill her, 
For in doing so, you spoil good economics. It's about money. When in, when in complete submission, she will train her offspring in the early years to submit to labor when they become of age. Under, understanding is the best thing. Therefore, we shall go deeper into this area of the subject matter concerning what we have produced here in this breaking process of a female nigger. These are the terms that he's using. This is not something I wrote. We have reversed the relationships. In her natural uncivilized state, she would have a strong dependency on the uncivilized nigger male, and she would have a limited protective tendency toward her independent male offspring and would raise the female offspring to be dependent like her. Nature had provided for this type of balance. We reverse nature by burning and pulling one civilized nigger apart and, and bull whipping the other to the point of death, all in her presence. By her being left alone, unprotected, with the male image destroyed. The ordeal caused her to move from her psychological dependent state to a frozen independent state. The, in this frozen psychological state of independence, she will raise her male and female offspring in reversed roles. For fear of the young male's life, she will psychologically train him to be mentally weak and dependent, but physically strong. Because she has become psychologically independent, she will train her female offsprings to be psychologically independent. What have you got? You've got the nigger woman out front and the man behind and scared. Look at us today, brothers and sisters. Reversed roles. Who is working today, brothers and sisters? The black woman. Who's making more money? The black woman. Who is more educated? The black woman. Whose world are we in? The white man's world. He allows in his world to put the woman in front. If the woman is in front, she's taking the role of who? The male. In the Bible and in the Quran, it says man is the maintainer of woman. But in the white man's kingdom, he reverses that which God has made nature for us and natural. He reverses our nature and he puts the woman in front. He makes his society where she can go out and be employed. But when you come and ask for a job, oh, I'm sorry, you are overqualified. Not qualified enough. We just gave the last job to another person. So your woman is out in front of you. She's working. She's bringing home the bread and butter. He's got her bamboozled because now 
with a little money in her pocket. She starts getting a little heavy voice. With a little money in her pocket, her mouth is uncontrollable. What is she saying to you? Father, she's saying, I make the money in this house. I pay the cost to be the boss. If you don't like what I say, you know what to do. She's not seeing the bigger picture, the hidden hand. She's not seeing the hidden hand of the white man, the slave master. We have the appearance of being free, but he's still in all of our affairs. She's working, feeling her empowerment that he gave her, the white man. You, every day, going out beating the road to find a job, and you come home empty-handed. Some of these women know that you're intelligent and even smarter than them. But then they begin to wonder, what's wrong with my John? What's wrong with my Henry that he can't bring home no money to support his family? They don't know what's wrong, but they're asking, what's wrong? I'll tell you what's wrong. It is the white man who are in all of our affairs. This is his world and his kingdom. When he stole the black man from over in Africa, he never intended on him being a man. He never intended on him taking care of his woman. He never intended on him having power and authority. So in his world, in order to break him, he reverses the roles and makes it seem like progress to us when we are out there working out in his vineyard. We are happy about our degrees we received, the money we are making. But as we rise, he's pulling the black man down. If he meant good for us, we would be rising together, side by side. This has been a trick to make black women think that we are so much more than our man that God gave us. He didn't produce himself, nor did we produce ourselves. We were produced and given life by God Almighty. God doesn't make an inferior product nor mate for you because he is not inferior. We are in this world, the kingdom of the white man's world. Opportunity for the black woman, but none for the black man. 
confusing our relationships. We have been put out in front for so long, sisters, until we have lost our femininity. It is not your fault. It was by design. Just as lesbianism is by design. He seated you for role reversal. If you are paying the lights, the gas, the rent, and you are putting the food on the table, with no help from the male, then you automatically feel like I'm a man. I don't need you. I only need you for the physical joys or pleasure.